with its long hours and hot ovens, baking is not a cushy job, but it is a career that Nancy Silverton has chosen with passion and dedication, and she's become an immense success with her La Brea Bakery in the Los Angeles area. I wake up every day knowing I'm doing what I want, she says. Early in her career, Nancy worked in pastry at Ma Maison in Hollywood, and when its chef, Wolfgang Puck, opened his famous Spago restaurant on Sunset Boulevard, she became his head pastry chef. It was there she met her husband, Mark Peel, and together they decided to open their own restaurant, Campanile, which also included a bakery. The problem was, says Nancy, that I was not a bread baker. I kind of worked backwards. I opened the bakery and then I learned to bake bread. After studying with the legendary Gaston Lenotre near Paris, she began her own experiments, living and breathing bread 24 hours a day for six months. She modestly neglects to say that she was already an accomplished cook and pastry chef, or it would have taken her six years rather than six months. One of the most important ingredients in bread making is the yeast. Many of Nancy's breads are made with her own special starter, based on the Lenotre principles it uses grapes as a fermenting yeast producing agent. And although it wants a good 10 days of sitting around before it's ready to work, it's simple indeed to make. You use only a portion of the starter for each batch of dough, then you replenish the remaining starter by feeding it with more flour. Then you can use it for the next batch of dough, and so on. A starter is actually alive and will keep for years as long as you give it an occasional feed. Chef Nancy Silverton has generously shared some of her very personal secrets of baking. I'm going to show you a sourdough starter that produces what I think is the best bread of all. This is a starter that's made with grapes, water, and flour. The grapes provide the food source for the wild yeast in the air and in the flour grains themselves to feed off of and live and multiply. What you need to do is you need to tie up a pound of grapes in some cheesecloth and then you need to bash it around a little to release some of the juices which you see that I'm doing. Get your aggressions out a little, right? Okay, and we're going to mix up a slurry of some flour and water. And then submerge the grapes into this mixture. And this is where these grapes are going to live for the next week, hopefully, in a place of honor in your kitchen. Submerge the grapes into the flour and water mixture, cover it, and leave it at room temperature for a week. I want to show you what you're going to see throughout the week as your grape, water, and flour mixture takes on a life of its own. You know, the first time I made a starter, what I did is I would let it go for a couple days. I'd look at it. I'd smell it. It smelled awful. It looked awful, and I'd throw it away. And I did this a few times until I finally had the patience to let the starter run the course of the week and be able to come up with the bread that I'm making now. After the first two days, what happens is there, there's a slight separation. The alcohol from the fermentation rises to the top. It starts to uh, take on a very slightly sour flavor. The bag is still inflated that, that contain the grapes. Not much activity, as you can see. By the fourth day, you know, just two days later, you can say, see a huge change in this mixture. The smell is starting to smell very, very cheese-like almost, kind of uh, not, not too pleasant. You see a lot of bubbling activity. The bag of grapes have deflated, and the flavor of the flour, of the, of the sour, is much stronger than, than it was earlier on. At this point, you're actually, you could make bread from this, but I feel it's best to let it go another uh, three or four days to really develop a strong, strong sour characteristic. And by the sixth day, great changes have taken place. My bag full of grapes is completely deflated. The color of the grapes are, have oozed into the starter itself. I have a separation between the alcohol fermentation 
and the, the density of the flour. The smell is strong. The taste is strong and, and I find quite delicious. However, it's hungry. This mixture is alive. It hasn't eaten for six days. It needs flour. So let me show you how to feed your starter. You need to discard and squeeze out the grapes. And here in front of me, I have the starter minus the grapes and my food, water, and flour. Incorporate the flour and water into your starter. Cover it and put it in a warm place in your kitchen. And in about 8 to 10 hours, your starter will be active and healthy and bubbly and ready to be turned into a loaf of bread. For the rustic dough, I have my bread flour in the food processor. And to it, I'm going to add my healthy sourdough starter and a little bit of already activated yeast. And with the machine running, I'm going to be adding my water and milk, my olive oil, and lastly, the salt. I'll be processing this for about a minute after the dough actually comes together in a ball around the center. This is a good point to stop and have a look at your dough, acquaint yourself with really the way that it, uh, the way that it feels. Notice how sticky this dough, this dough really is and should be. Also taste it. Make sure you remembered all your ingredients, your salt, your olive oil, your milk. We're going to let this sit for about five minutes so the flour can absorb the excess water and then reprocess it to finish the, the kneading process. Now I've transferred my dough to a well-oiled bowl. I'm going to be covering it with plastic and letting it rise for about two hours to develop both its flavor, its texture, and the growth that it needs. Over here I have a dough that I've already let gone through that rising process or fermenting process. You can see the beautiful network I have as I peel off the plastic. You can just imagine when this dough is baked, when you slice into it, the wonderful whole structure that it will have. There we go. Now I'm going to be doing two things with this dough. I'm going to be making the loaf itself and also the focaccia, so it's necessary for me to divide the dough in half. So if you are going to do the same thing as I am, make sure you put it onto a very well floured board. Sprinkle flour over the top. Stretch the dough out a little. I'm going to be transferring our rustic loaf to a piece of parchment paper that is heavily dusted with flour and semolina or finely ground cornmeal. Make sure you have a lot of flour, well flour underneath. Lift up the angles and simply scoop and then lay it out. Reform it a little. And then we're going to be covering it with the linen and letting it proof again the final time for two hours. Now that my dough has risen for about two hours, it's ready to go in the, in the oven to be baked. If you feel it, which is a very important step in, in, in bread making, you can feel that it's expanded as far as it's going to. That's something that's hard to communicate by words, but once you've done it over and over again, you'll know, you'll definitely know what I'm talking about. The top of the bread needs to be lightly floured again with a little flour and a sprinkling of the semolina. And we're going to invert it onto a, another piece of parchment paper. A little tricky, but works every time. 
Okay, slip the peel onto it. We're going to actually bake the, the loaf of bread directly on the parchment paper, which we'll be removing later. Dimple the surface. And now the bread is ready to go in the oven. My oven's been heating for the last hour at 500 degrees. It already has a ceramic tile in it, and this ceramic tile captures the heat and provides a bread that has a very, very crisp crust. I'm also going to be spritzing the oven. Allowing the bread to cook in a moist environment prevents the, any crust from forming on the bread immediately, and then the bread can rise and cook and have a very nice oven spring. Spritz the back and the sides of the oven. Close it so that you trap the moisture. Slip the bread into the oven and close it again. You need to repeat the spritzing process a few times over the next 10 minutes. It's been 30 minutes now, and so I'm going to take the bread out of the oven and invert it. Discarding the paper, this ensures that the bread colors evenly on both sides. It's been about 40 minutes and the bread should be done. So far, the first test in, in whether a bread is done is happening right now, and that's the smell in the air. The second test is always the color of the crust. And let's have a look here. It's a beautiful brown color. And that passed the test. And the third test is to listen to the sound when you knock it on the bottom. That thud, hear that thud, that hollow sound, ensures that the bread is baked all the way through. This is something I wouldn't ordinarily do, but I'm going to cut a slice of this very hot bread so you can see the texture that this bread provides. This is truly one of my favorite breads. Look at the texture in the, in the crumb of this bread, the large holes, the irregularity. It's really just a, a really sensual bread. Flat, puffy, and roughly rectangular. This unusual rustic loaf is easy to serve. Just break a piece off and serve it with soups and salads or take it on a picnic, stuff it for sandwiches. It makes absolutely wonderful toast. Nancy Silverton makes all kinds of breads from the same dough. As we've just seen, she sets aside half of the dough and she's gonna turn it into focaccias. I'm using a round cutter to cut out the dough for the focaccia. Now this is the same dough as I used for the flat rustic bread. These focaccia are a good way to be able to combine your baking talents with your cooking talents. As you see, we have a beautiful assortment of roasted vegetables. The only thing important in making these focaccia is really to make them look as luscious as possible. I'm putting on some bitter, sturdy greens as a decoration for the edges of the focaccia. Once you get the lettuces around the, the uh, outside of the dough, it's time to garnish them with really anything you really like. I, I love the roasted peppers in combination with the goat cheese, and so that's what I'm going to make my first one. And maybe a little Parmesan on top. Another great combination are these roasted boiling onions. These are roasted in the oven with rosemary oil and salt and pepper. Maybe a little fresh thyme and a little more Parmesan. Let's get some currant tomatoes. These tomatoes, when they cook, all of the juices cook out of the tomato and you're left with a nice caramelized, intense tomato flavor. Now a very unusual one I'm going to do is a black or red seedless grape. This one I Garnish with a little bit of sprinkled anise, a little granulated sugar, and some rosemary sprigs. I think I'm going to add a little poppy seeds to the goat cheese and the pepper. Let's add a little sesame to the potato. So these I'll put into the oven. They'll bake for about 35 to 40 minutes. This is what to expect when you take them out of the oven. This is what they will look like. These focaccias are really wonderful just, just out of the oven as is. They're sort of a sister or a cousin to the pizza. But oftentimes, we let them cool down and slice them in half 
and fill them with some greens with a simple vinaigrette, maybe some more roasted vegetables inside, and they make really fantastic sandwiches. What's so satisfying and rewarding when you make focaccias is that even if you've never baked bread before, when you take them out of the oven, they'll look just as good as these. Now Chef Nancy's going to show us how to make her famous olive bread. This is that it's baked without any commercial yeast, and it's formed in a wicker basket. And that's this wonderful aroma of baked bread and olives, and this really is a favorite among La Brea Bakery's customers. The dough from the olive bread is very different than the dough that I use for the rustic bread. First of all, it's a much firmer dough, and second of all, it has no commercial yeast. It uh, relies solely on the strength of the sourdough starter to, to make it rise. I'm starting with my flour in the, the bowl of the food processor and adding the starter to it. A little fresh thyme and some wheat germ. I like to add wheat germ or bran or some coarse wheat to any white dough to give it a little bit more character. Now with this olive bread, I use two kinds of olives. I use oil-cured Moroccan olives and also Kalamata olives. I use the oil-cured olives because they really taint the dough, giving it both flavor but a beautiful purpley color. And I like the Kalamata olives because they're very winey tasting and they're very firm and they hold up to being mixed so that you're left with big chunks of olive in the dough. I'm going to turn on the machine and begin to slowly add the water and follow it with the addition of the salt and let it process until it goes around the blade, the center blade. Okay, now let's check the dough to see if we need to add any more water or in some cases more flour. No, this feels really, really terrific. It's not too hot, which is very important in, in, in bread making, that you maintain a temperature of around 75, 78 degrees. It's sticky, which you want, but not wet. I'm going to allow the dough to rest a bit in the machine, 5, 10 minutes, let the water continue to be absorbed by the flour. The dough's rested for about 10 minutes already, and so now I'm going to let it process about 20 to 30 seconds more before I add my olives. That looks about right. Kalamata. And the oil cured. Take the dough out of the bowl and finish the kneading by hand. Whether I make a, a dough in a machine or not, I always like to have the last few minutes be kneaded by hand. It gives you more contact with the dough. Gathered up together, you can see it's very, very wet and oily at this point, but within a minute or so, it's going to feel like a nice firm dough again. When kneading the dough, it's good to lift it up, slap it down, and rotate it. Also, I've learned by, by the hard way to try to use only one hand in kneading, keeping the other hand free and clean in case something so important as a telephone rings or something. So when your dough is sufficiently kneaded, you'll be able to tell by the smoothness of the surface of the dough. The dough has become a little bit more elastic and a little bit more firm. Gather it together and place it in a lightly oiled bowl. Cover it with plastic and allow it to sit for two, two and a half hours until it doubles in bulk. Now that the bread has risen a good two to two and a half times its size, we're ready to give it its final shape. Another way to tell if the bread has risen, besides going by the volume, 
is by pressing your finger into it, and if it doesn't spring immediately back, it means that it is ready to be, to be shaped. So turn the bread gently out of the mixing bowl. Dust it with a little flour. Now I would like to make two loaves of bread out of this dough. And I'm simply going to eyeball it. The basket that I'm going to put the shaped dough into is a cloth lined basket. They call these a bonnetone in French. The linen that's in it is actually sewn into the basket. But a simple tea towel or cloth draped into it will also work that's not sewn down. To shape your bread into a, in, into a boule, which is merely a tucking of the dough into the center, it's easy to start that way by just lifting the bread up and tucking it all to the center, trying to get an even thickness all the way around. This helps you to form the ball shape that you're going to end up with. Once you get your dough into your center, you can begin to roll the four corners also into the center. Once you feel that this dough is tightening up, you can use a little bit more force, cupping your hands around the bottom of the dough and obtaining a certain amount of friction between your work surface and the dough itself. If you spray a little water on the work surface, that movement will become much more easy. So once you've gotten a taunt ball, lift it up and place it in your cloth line basket. And then this we're going to cover again with plastic wrap and let it sit out at room temperature for about two hours until you feel the dough beginning to move again. And then we're going to refrigerate it overnight. As it's been fermenting and as you've been sleeping, the bread has been developing in both flavor and texture. Yeah, that's fine. It should be about 72 or 74 degrees before it goes into the oven. I use as a standard meat thermometer. Turn the bread out gently onto the peel. And we're going to score it with a, with a razor blade. You can also use a sharp knife. The scoring of the bread is both for decorative purposes, but also it provides the opening that guides the bread as it grows its final time in the oven. Don't forget to spritz the oven. Get a lot of moisture in there. Once it's baked for 45 minutes, you'll get a wonderful crusty brown loaf of olive bread. This is truly one of my favorite breads. It's chewy, it's crusty, it's olivey, it's herby. I know you'll enjoy making it at home, and I know even more you'll enjoy eating it. Baking does indeed involve all the senses. There's the feel of the dough at every stage in the making, and the smell and the sound of it being slapped around. It's alive, and it's never quite the same twice in a row. Then there's the thrill and the pride of eating your own loaf. It's an addictive hobby, and for Nancy Silverton, a passionate, all-absorbing profession. How fortunate we are that she's wanted to share it with us. This is Julia Child for Cooking with Master Chefs. Bon appétit. Bon appétit.